Hello, I'm uh, Ted Morrissey, and this is a video for my course on classic horror and sci-fi by women writers for Lindawood University's MFA in Writing program. And uh, this is basically the first video I've made for this session. And uh, we're looking at a couple of pieces, or have looked at a couple of pieces. And so I want to pull a couple of very specific things from them to kind of call your attention to and maybe encourage you to think about in terms of uh, your own writing and uh, that kind of thing. And uh, the first uh, story that we looked at together and that I want to talk about is The Secret Chamber by Margaret Oliphant. And uh, it first appeared in 1876 in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine. And uh, as you know, uh, the story begins with a you know, kind of lengthy description of Castle Gowrie and uh, maybe Gowry, I'm not sure really how to say that. And uh, I just want to read a little bit just to kind of uh, refresh your memory or if, you know, out there in YouTube land, you're not familiar with the story. But uh, it begins, this is chapter one, in fact. Castle Gallery is one of the most famous and interesting in all Scotland. It is a beautiful old house to start with, perfect and old feudal grandeur with its clustered turrets and walls that could withstand an army. Its labyrinths, its hidden stairs, its long, mysterious passages, passages that seem in many cases to lead to nothing, but of which no one can be too sure what they lead to. The front, with its fine gateway and flanking towers, is approached now by velvet lawns and peaceful, beautiful old avenue with double rows of trees like a cathedral, in the woods of which the gray towers rise, or out of which the gray towers rise, look as soft and rich in foliage, if not so lofty in growth as the groves of the south. But this softness of aspect is all new to the place, that is new within the century or two, which count for but little in the history of a dwelling place, some part of which at least has been standing since the days when the Saxon eighthlings or princes brought such share of art as belonged to them to solidify and regulate the original Celtic art, which reared incised stones upon rude burial places and twined mystic knots on its crosses before historic days. Even of this primitive decoration, there are relics at gallery where the twistings and twinings of runic cords appear still on some bits of ancient wall, solid as rock, and almost as everlasting. It actually goes on a bit from there. So that's how um, Oliphant begins this story. And uh, uh, it is definitely right out of the Gothic tradition. As you are uh, probably familiar, uh, Gothic stories, uh, which were you know, very popular in the 1800s, particularly the early part of the 1800s, um, you know, have certain sort of telltale characteristics. Uh, one of those telltale characteristics is the setting it tends to be very remote, very atmospheric, um, castles on lonely windswept cliffs, um, haunted mansions, abandoned monasteries, you know, that kind of thing. So the, these, these houses, these environments that, again, are very atmospheric and oftentimes sort of communicate a sense of, of dread almost. And um, so Oliphant definitely embraces that Gothic setting and begins her story with this lengthy uh, description of the castle. Now, I don't know if today, um, you know, most editors or readers or publishers would respond especially well to beginning a short story, particularly with a long descriptive passage having to do with setting. Maybe if it's really well done, may, maybe they would let that fly. We, we tend to nowadays be uh, more inclined to want to start in media race and in, in the middle of things you know, with action well underway and then maybe step back uh, after hopefully we've got uh, the reader's attention um, and uh, maybe give more setting detail then. But in any event, um, setting and particularly a Gothic setting element like this is a, uh, a staple of horror writing. 
Um, I think of um, The Haunting of Hill House by uh, Shirley Jackson, which um, is very specifically about a haunted house and, and, and the entire novel uh, takes place in it, essentially, and, and so on. Uh, but we can find, you know, example after example after example of, of these, um, you know, different kinds of Gothic settings. Um, now, today's authors um, will sometimes use a tried and true uh, setting like that and will have a, you know, an abandoned house or something like that. Um, if you are familiar with the series uh, Stranger Things, uh, season four, I think that's the one that just wrapped up. I'm not going to give anything away, but there's a abandoned, haunted, possessed, whatever you want to call it, house that figures prominently in that season. And so we return again and again to this this, this space, very much a gothic element. Uh, we can find, like I said, lots of examples. I mentioned uh, The Haunting of Hill House. That's a Netflix series. There's been a couple of uh, a couple of seasons so far. Uh, the first was inspired by the original uh, Shirley Jackson uh, novel. Uh, season two was inspired more by, not more, definitely, by uh, Henry James's uh, The Turn of the Screw, which is set in a kind of isolated mansion with all kinds of weird things happening in it. So Henry James, who was writing around the turn of the 20th century, was still very much invoking those Gothic elements in his fiction. And then that's transferred to 21st century, you know, streaming service. Um, but there certainly have been variations on that theme. Like I said, there are still writers who are playing with that idea of the, of the of the Gothic, uh, traditional Gothic setting, whether it's a castle or a mansion or a, like I said, abandoned monastery, something like that. But other um, writers have kind of taken that and have um, have, have uh, played with the idea, but but changed it around. And, and particularly, what I'm thinking of are uh, are horror stories that incorporate science fiction elements, like spaceships. And I think, um, for instance, of the um, of the uh, original Alien movie, and then, of course, the Alien series, but one of the reasons the original Alien movie uh, was so frightening, and I remember seeing it on opening night, and it scared the bejeebers out of me, is that you've got this monster loose in a spaceship um, that there's no escape from, basically, right? So people are trapped in the spaceship. But if you've seen that movie, and, and probably you have, it's, it's a classic, it's been around for decades now, um, you know that beyond just that basic premise of, um, of the, uh, uh, you know, being trapped in a spaceship, the spaceship itself is very gothic. It's got lots of nooks and crannies, and there's this interior ductwork that, you know, characters go into to try to flush out the monster very claustrophobic and dark and 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 uh and you know lots of twists and turns in this spaceship you know so even though it's a spaceship it's very similar to a sort of old abandoned castle or haunted house and again it's got this sort of uh, leaky you know feel to it the pipes are dripping and you know it's just not very clean it's not a, it's not a star trek kind of spaceship, you know, it's not the Enterprise, it's uh, kind of old and, and, and worn out and, and so forth. Uh, if you think about that movie further, you know that when they go down to the planet's surface, it's storming, um, where they initially encounter the alien eggs, it's like this foggy mist or whatever. And so those are all just taken right out of classic gothic horror, whether it's the stormy you know, setting, the the foggy, mysterious, misty environment, and then the, the the castle or the haunted dwelling of some sort, which is the spaceship. And so those writers or that writer took, you know, the classic Gothic elements and turned it into, you know, a, a sci-fi movie. I also think of the, um, of the movie uh, uh, Event Horizon. I was just reading one of those Facebook articles that pops up about, you know, underrated movies from the last X number of years or whatever. And uh, Event Horizon popped up as a movie that should be a classic, you know, very well done that for whatever reason didn't do well in its time and has kind of been largely forgotten. But um, Event Horizon, which you may not be familiar with because, like I said, it didn't get 
uh, nearly as much of a, of a solid reputation as some other movies, is about a, uh, a spaceship that um, goes to the edge of the known universe and then it disappears with the crew. And then later the spaceship comes back and the crew is gone. So another crew is put on board and sent out to the same place in space to try to figure out what happened to the first crew. And it's just a classic horror story from, from there. Basically, the spaceship is a haunted house. I think the, the article I read made that point. The spaceship is, in essence, a haunted house out in space. Um, so, so, yeah, so you can, um, you can take those gothic elements and you can either use them sort of traditionally um, or you can find new ways of incorporating them. Um, I've been particularly interested for about the last decade or so in a brand of, of uh, horror writing uh, known as um, Midwestern Gothic. Um, kind of plays off the idea of Southern Gothic, but the idea is that the Midwest has its own sort of elements that can be sort of eerie and, and again, atmospheric. The, the lonely prairie, you know, isolated farms, you know, all those kinds of things. And uh, so there is that sort of tradition of taking these, you know, Midwestern elements and turning them into a setting for for horror stories, right? Uh, it could be a, a ship at sea. It could be, you know, anywhere basically, right? Could be turned into a sort of gothic setting, right? So that's something to think about. You know, what what might be a sort of classic gothic setting that you might uh, want to recreate? Or can you think of some environments that you can uh, take that normally aren't gothic horror environments and um, turn them into them in some way or another, right? Okay, so that's one thought that I had uh, regarding the secret chamber. The other um, story that we read for this uh, last go around, and sorry, I should have bookmarked this, but I think I can get to it. Yeah, this is... Um, E or Edith Nesbitt's uh, From the Dead. And uh, as you know, it's uh, originally published in 1880 uh, and, and first appeared in the Illustrated London News. Periodicals used to have the coolest names. Unfortunately, we've kind of lost that. But um, there's a couple of things about this um, story I want to sort of highlight uh, just for your further reflection. Uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight was the fact that it does start in a much more modern way, whereas, you know, the Oliphant story starts with this lengthy description of setting. Um, this is right into the action, right? It starts off section one uh, with a quote, you know, dialogue, but true or not true, your bro brother is a scoundrel. No man, no decent man tells such things, end quote. He did not tell me. How dare you suppose it? I found the letter in his desk. And since she was my friend and you were a sweetheart, I never thought there could be any harm in my reading anything she might write to my brother. Give me back the letter. I was a fool to tell you. I had a helmet held out her hand for the letter, etc. cetera. Uh, and then just very shortly, we get the actual letter. Dear, I do, I do, I love you, but it's impossible. So we get, you know, we get the letter verbatim in the text of the story. And then there are... Uh, some other examples of bits and pieces of letters and notes and things. So, so again, one of the things I want to highlight there is that this does start in a much more modern way, starting with dialogue, very fast, uh, you know, action kind of thing. That's a much more uh, common way to see short stories, particularly start nowadays. Um, so Nesbitt was doing this in 1880, so that's pretty impressive. Um, so we certainly can begin a, a sort of classic horror story in, in, a, in a way that we're very familiar. Um, notice this uses letters and notes and things. Um, again, certainly that can be incorporated into a, a, a you know, modern story. You see a lot now with bringing in um, other kinds of communication you know, applications. So now in stories and movies and TV shows and, and the like, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, text messages, tweets, you know, whatever, you know, being used to communicate back and forth. Um, it seems to be coming kind of a kind of a, a modern trope. Um, I just watched something the other day uh, where this happens where a, a character disappears 
you know, in the very beginning of, of the show. Um, and then um, someone who's trying to find them starts getting text messages from their phone, but it's not clear whether they're actually coming from the missing person or whoever abducted them or murdered them or whatever. Um, also watched a, a movie just last night where there's like a, a haunted telephone and this telephone keeps ringing. And whenever someone picks it up, they're, they're speaking to the, to the beyond or whatever. Um, and so, so anyway, the point here is that this idea of, of letters and written, you know, handwritten communication on paper can certainly be updated and transformed in our modern world, but still, you know, be used in, in very much the same sorts of ways in terms of, you know, creating, you know, plot devices, creating, you know, um, atmospherics about, you know, about, you know, messages from the beyond or whatever it might be, right? So, so that's another thing I want to kind of point out. But there's a very specific, um, you know, event, I guess, you know, in this story that is kind of a trope in its, in its own way. And so I wanted to kind of call your attention to it and get you thinking about it. And this is from the end of section two, page 87, if you're following along at home. Um, and I'll just read a little bit here to kind of refresh our memories. I stood by the bedstead. I looked down on my wife's face just so I had seen it lie on the pillow beside me in the early morning when the wind and the dawn came up from beyond the sea. She did not look like one dead. Her lips were still red, and it seemed to me that a tinge of color lay on her cheek. It seemed to me, too, that if I kissed her, she would awaken and put her slight hand on my neck and lay her cheek against mine, and that we should tell each other everything and weep together and understand and be comforted. So I stooped and laid my lips to hers as the old nurse stole from the room, but the red lips were like marble, and she did not waken. She will not waken now ever anymore. I tell you again, there are some things that cannot be written. But the idea of kissing the dead, that just when I when I kind of reread this story this, this time around, that really stood out to me as something that a lot of writers have kind of played with. Um, again, I watched something recently where this was kind of a thing where a mother passes away and, and a young daughter wants to kiss her in, in her casket at the, at the funeral and people kind of go a little crazy because what are you doing? You know, you know, leave your mother alone or whatever. Right. Um, I was also thinking of um, the, the, the novel and the, and the, and the modern movie, the re remade movie, but the, but the novel uh, true grit by uh, Charles Porter, I think maybe you're getting the last name wrong, but great novel. Um, and, you know, it's a Western uh, but there's a, a scene where, again, a young girl uh, goes to a funeral parlor and, and her um, father is there, who's passed away. And the funeral director, the mortician, the undertaker, whatever, uh, tells her that if she wants to, she can kiss her father. Um, it's OK. You know, she opts not to. She thinks that's kind of weird. Um, and then I was also thinking about... Um, Mary Shelley's classic uh, novel Frankenstein and somewhat different take on that, but it's one that critics have really made hay with over the centuries, uh, particularly uh, looking at it from a sort of psychoanalytic view. But there is a scene where uh, Victor Frankenstein um, dr has his dream and he's walking through the streets of the place where he lives, Ingolstadt, Germany. And he sees his cousin, who's also his fiance, love interest, whatever. Um, and he hasn't seen her for, for, you know, months and months and months. And so he greets her. He's overjoyed, you know, to, to be meeting up with her again. And they embrace. And he plants a big kiss on her lips. Well, as he's kissing her, she turns into his dead mother's corpse. And so when he kind of pulls away, he's been kissing his dead mother's corpse and there's like grave worms and he's very gross kind of thing. And um, again, you know, psychoanalytical, psychoanalytic criticism has has uh, made much of that over, over the centuries. But that's sort of a, a, a you know, a, a variation on this theme of kissing the dead. But anyway, I just, um, 
you know, I bring that up because it is a thing that comes up again in, in literature and in movies and so forth again and again and again. And that might be an interesting, you know, uh, piece of uh, scholarship and, and, and so forth in its own. Why, why does that keep coming up? You know, what's going on there? But um, but maybe it's something that we could think about in, in terms of uh, some narrative and what would we do with it? Would, would we, you know, have a character kiss a deceased relative um, and be perfectly okay? Uh, no big deal. Would it be frowned upon? Would it invoke all kinds of, or evoke uh, all kinds of, of other kinds of emotions and ideas. Um, so, again, it's something that a lot of writers have played with, and maybe it's something that's worth uh, thinking about of our own. All right. So I'd be interested to uh, hear what you have to say, either about uh, incorporating a Gothic setting into a contemporary story, or maybe, you know, uh, things like using modern communication tools uh, to accomplish some of the same things that used to be accomplished via uh, handwritten on paper sorts of uh, correspondence um, or that very specific sort of thing of, of kissing the dead and uh, you know how that might be worked into a, a modern sort of narrative. All right. So I will stop there. I uh, look forward to seeing you down the digital road.